So thank you, Daniela, for those kind words. And I'm excited today to talk to you today about my research that I've been doing uh, during my PhD on semi-cooperative planning for mixed human autonomous environments. Oh, let me see if this works. So the goal of my research and really the motivating thing is self-driving cars has been such an interesting and exciting field um, in the technology and car space. Um, on the right are just some examples of some of the autonomous vehicles that I've encountered during my PhD while at MIT. And many car companies and technology companies are interested in this because of the many benefits that self-driving cars has to our everyday lives. So for example, from a safety perspective, autonomous vehicles can reduce the number of vehicular collisions, which lead to a surprisingly high number of deaths in America. Second is efficiency. So if we have a roadways with connected and autonomous vehicles, we can think about improving the efficiency of our roads, reducing wait times and travel times on the road. And finally, we can think about how autonomous vehicles can really improve accessibility, providing driving independence to those that can no longer drive anymore, whether that is because of their age or if they are disabled. And so a question I get a lot um, as someone who researches this is really how far are we from achieving this technology? So I'd like to do a bit of a field trip to Phoenix, Arizona about a month ago. And when I was in Arizona, I got the opportunity to open up an app and actually call an autom autonomous vehicle to pick me up. And I got to go into the car and I pressed start and off we went on a ride to a park that I, I wanted to go to. And uh, in many ways, it really felt like the technology is here. And in some ways, you know, made me wonder if perhaps the research is, is not really necessary. But if we actually look a little bit closer, I think we can see that there's still ways to go. And in fact, I thought this picture was a bit cute when I was sitting in the autonomous car, uh, there's a truck in front of me that says they're still hiring drivers. So I think we, we still have what to, to solve. And looking a little bit closer, um, we can actually look at the route that our self-driving car took on the left that took me from uh, my hotel to the park. And on the right is what uh, Google Maps would provide to just a normal human driver trying to go on the same uh, route. And what you can actually see is that there are three routes that the human driver would be provided that's actually different than the route our self-driving car took. So you could ask the question, what is our self-driving car trying to avoid? And first we can look at this map and see that it's actually trying to avoid highway driving. So highways have many dynamic and high-speed vehicles it's very challenging still for autonomous vehicles to be able to navigate with human drivers on highways. And if we look at the other two routes that a human driver would have taken, you will have noticed if you zoomed in on Google Maps that it has to go through complex intersections with multiple vehicles driving at the same time through that intersection. And more generally speaking, these kind of represent some of the challenges in these mixed human autonomous environments. So on the highway side, we have things like dynamic maneuvers, high-speed vehicles, we have to think about the blind spots of the vehicles around us with limited perception. And then at intersections, we have complicated coordination of multiple vehicles with conflicting goals. And then more generally speaking, we also have to think about error-prone human drivers who are going to be going very close to each other in these dangerous scenarios at intersections. And if we want to achieve this goal of autonomous vehicles on the road, we can't just tell our autonomous vehicle not to go to these scenarios. We really need our autonomy to, to operate safely and efficient in all these environments. So, and if actually, if you look back at the vehicles I showed you before, and you kind of looked carefully at, at the news, you'll notice that a lot of these companies have actually either slowed down their expectations for autonomous vehicles, or even completely stopped working on self-driving cars. And more generally speaking, there is this kind of sobering effect in the community of realizing how challenging some of these everyday scenarios are when you have to do autonomy with human drivers still on the road. And so my goal throughout my PhD has been really, how do we develop autonomous systems that work with the humans in the environment? And just to give a kind of motivating example, we can imagine the challenge of trying to control an autonomous emergency vehicle while still interacting with human drivers on the road. And some of the things we have to think about is first of all, our autonomous vehicle has to anticipate human maneuvers. And meanwhile, also considering its own vehicle dynamics. So the control problem in itself is difficult, but now we have to think about how do we actually interact with the human drivers and ultimately efficiently navigate the road. And there's of course existing work in this area and you can kind of group them into three uh, buckets of research. The first are driver dynamics where you model the velocity of the vehicles, either based on the distance between vehicles or for example, estimating them online. And the challenge here is that you have very prescribed or simple reactions of the human agents. 
you can't actually model that these agents are actually planning. You're just trying to avoid the other vehicles without really considering that they themselves are planning on the road. On the other kind of extreme of that are multi-agent planning areas where you do explicitly consider the fact that the other agents on the road are planning, but you're typically limited to either thinking that all the vehicles are cooperative. So for example, on a team of vehicles that you're controlling or the other extreme where you have fully competitive racing game theoretic algorithms that assume that you're optimizing a zero sum game. And then finally, and perhaps the most uh, readily used today are these database prediction methods that utilize a lot of the cutting edge and neural networks where the idea is that you train your network on driver data. And then when you actually deploy your autonomous vehicle, you observe the positions of the vehicles and try and predict forward their trajectories. And the challenge here is that while they're good at doing short-term prediction, these neural network approaches typically fail at long-term behavior prediction. In addition, this prediction is very isolated from the autonomous planner itself. So typically your autonomy just takes as given that these are, are the future trajectories of the vehicles and you don't get to model how the vehicles are actually going to react to your own actions in the world. And so at a high level, what I've been trying to do in my PhD is to go away from this model of black box modeling of the agents and predicting their velocities, and then just trying to avoid colliding with other vehicles and thinking a little bit more deeply about how do the agents on the road actually do their decision making and then plan our autonomous vehicles so that they can naturally interact with those agents. And so the high level thesis of my thesis that I've been working on over the past few years is how can we actually incorporate models of human decision making into our vehicle's own autonomy? And so just to give you a high level kind of outline of what I'll be talking about today is I'll start off by giving you some background on this concept social value orientation that we utilize in the remainder of the talk. And then I'll walk you through four different algorithms and four different problem domains that I've been looking at in developing algorithms so that we can have more semi-cooperative planning. And I'll be focusing primarily on algorithms. So I'll be trying to walk you through these algorithms, but along the way, I'll also be talking a bit about the systems that I've developed during my PhD to help enable us to evaluate and deploy these algorithms. In addition, some experimentation that we've done with these algorithms to better understand how they actually work when we are deploying them in different populations of humans. So I'll start off with uh, some background on social value orientation. And the idea here is if we wanna understand how humans make decisions, we can actually look towards the social psychology community to better understand humans. And one of the common observations that scientists have found is that humans actually act very cooperatively. So unlike more economic models where agents just are self-rational and self-interested, humans are actually quite cooperative. And psychologists have actually demonstrated this in laboratory settings where you give participants money and you ask them how much of that money do you wanna to give to yourself versus how much of that money do you wanna to give to others? And by doing so, you can actually plot on the X axis, for example, how much of that reward they take for themselves and how much reward they take for others. And if you plot each participant on this plot, what you can find is that there's a distribution of personalities or different SVOs for each individual that ranges from egoistic people that only care about getting reward for themselves and other agents that are more pro-social who would like to split the reward with others. And this ring is called the social value orientation ring. And this has actually been utilized for driving scenarios. So for example, if you think of the social value orientation as some angle theta i, which is corresponding to each participant on your road, you can then model a utility function for each of those agents that they're optimizing. That's a combination of their own reward ri and rj, which is the reward of the other agents on the road, modulated by this theta i, which is the SVO of each individual on the road to create this utility function vi. And researchers have actually shown that you can predict and estimate these theta i's at, on the road um, while driving. And so now with this perspective that each participant on the road has some SVO of theta i, we like to consider how can we actually deploy this on our cars and use this to solve some problems, some challenges that still remain in the autonomous uh, field. So in the first algorithm I'll start off with, I'm going to look again at that problem of controlling an autom autonomous emergency vehicle. And specifically our goal is to come up with an algorithm that can generate control inputs for our ambulance along the road as it's traversing and navigating traffic with human drivers on the road. And we'll start off with how you would typically kind of do this type of optimization where you would generate or formulate some agent specific reward. So some RI that's going to be a function of your own control input and thus in your own state. So for example, how fast you're driving so to try and incentivize speed 
or for example, to try and minimize the amount of effort, so the amount of acceleration or steering. And then if you combine this with constraints based off on the vehicle dynamics or cost for contour tracking or steering acceleration constraints, you can actually formulate an agent-specific optimization where you are now selecting some control input UI that optimizes your reward, RI, subject to some constraints based off of your dynamics and, for example, collision avoidance constraints. So that's how you would typically do it. But now what we'd like to do is consider this idea of SVO, that our agents are actually social beings. And so now instead of using just RI, we're going to introduce this utility function into our optimization. So now each agent has a utility function VI, which is going to be now a combination of their own reward RI and RJ. And this can now be substituted into the optimization we're considering, where now we're optimizing over both theta I, RI, and also the reward of other agents, RJ. So pictorially at a high level, what's happening here is we're thinking of all of our agents on the road as having some known SVO that we've already estimated. And now what we'd like to do is consider the fact that each of the agents have some utility function that's going to be based off of their SVO and also the rewards, their own self reward and the reward of the other agents. Now, one limitation of this kind of model is that we aren't able to actually model the heterogeneity between vehicles. What we'd like to be able to do is be able to model the fact that some agents, for example, might be more cooperative to our ambulance than, for example, the other vehicles on the road. So the first thing we did was introduce this idea of a pairwise, pairwise SVO. And the idea here is that instead of just having one personality, each vehicle is going to have a theta IJ that represents their pairwise level of cooperation between themselves and the other vehicles on the road. So at this point, we can now model the fact that vehicles are going to have different levels of cooperation with, with each other. But the next challenge is that we actually have to generate stable control inputs for our autonomous vehicle. And specifically, what we're going to try and find are control inputs and trajectories that yield a Nash equilibrium. And without going into too much detail, just at a high level, when we're trying to get a Nash equilibrium, what we're trying to hope to get to is a place where no one has really an incentive to deviate from their optimal uh, control inputs. And the benefit here is that we, it generates a level of stability in our system where people are not trying to deviate from their trajectories. And so, you know, this would be nice to get to, but this is typically challenging or computationally intractable to actually achieve. So uh, a common approach to actually getting towards your Nash equilibrium is to do an algorithm called iterative best response or IBR. And the idea in IBR is that we're going to iteratively try and solve the solution and try and converge towards a Nash equilibrium. And so the way iterative best response works is that in the first round, we're gonna consider the optimization for the first agent, fixing the control inputs of the other agents, and then selecting its own control input based on the optimization. And once it obtains its control input, repeat this for the other agents on the road. And this is, constitutes one round of iterative best response. We then update this and keep on this process for the next round of iterative best response, where each agent is uh, selecting their best response by fixing the other control inputs and selecting their own optimal control input. And the idea here is that if you repeat this enough times, you'll end up converging towards the Nash equilibrium where everyone's control inputs are going to be their optimum stable solution. Now, there's no theor theoretical guarantees that you'll actually get to the Nash equilibrium, but typically and empirically what we'll show later on in a future slide is we do typically converge towards the Nash equilibrium. So one of the limitations though with iterative best response is that we get very little cooperation or it's very limited cooperations in the solutions if we just run vanilla iterative best response. So just to kind of highlight that, what we would like to be able to get to are solutions where, for example, the blue vehicle might slow down because it's a cooperative agent to let the ambulance go in front of it. So I I'll call this kind of the global optimum that we'd like to get to. However, because by design, iterative best response controls the control, fixes the control inputs of the other agents, it will actually never consider the fact that the ambulance might speed up. And instead, it will always find itself converging to a local optimum where it just speeds up. But we know that now with this perspective that vehicles are semi-cooperative, we should create an algorithm that actually gets these more global optimum where everyone is happier, um, but still getting highly efficient solutions. And so the way we do this is we introduce to this new concept of a neighborhood of shared control, where behind the vehicles during when they're running best response, they get to actually select also the control inputs of the other agents when they're selecting their own uh, optimal control inputs. And the idea there is that you're, you're biasing the solutions towards these more cooperative maneuvers where you can imagine the, the scenarios where the other vehicle is also uh, cooperating. 
Now, we don't want to do this throughout all of iterative best response. So what we do is we start off in the initial rounds of IBR with a neighborhood of vehicles behind the agents. And then as IBR proceeds during the subsequent rounds of IBR, we shrink that neighborhood of control down to uh, no other vehicles. So we get back to vanilla iterative best response and get converged towards those Nash equilibrium. So this is uh, so you get these more cooperative uh, maneuvers that are, are globally optimum. So now what we can do is actually go and deploy this algorithm in simulation. So here what, I've sh what I'm showing you is a simulation where we have different densities of traffic. So here we have low density traffic and later we'll have higher density traffic. And we can also vary the personality. So here the colors correspond to whether they're egoistic, so red vehicles or more pro-social like the magenta or blue agents. So the first question we want to ask is, are we actually converging to Nash equilibrium? And what we can do is actually plot the change in the control inputs during subsequent rounds of iterative best response. And what I'm plotting here on the y-axis is the change in control inputs as iterative best response proceeds. And you can see that we're converging to a point where the control inputs are not changing in subsequent rounds of iterative best response, suggesting that we're converging to a Nash equilibrium. So now that we know that the algorithm kind of works how we'd like it to work, the next question is to kind of ask a more experimental question, which is how does the population or the personalities of the population impact our algorithm? So what we can do is actually rerun simulations with different SVOs of the agents. So you can see at the bottom, we have a fully egoistic population. And on the top, we have a more altruistic population. And on the right, what I'm doing is plotting how much further did the ambulance do given the population that, that it was driving around? And what you can see is as we get more altruistic agents, so the bottom we're plotting um, the SVO of the population, we get increased distance that the ambulance is able to travel. And what's nice is if we compare this to other baselines like zero sum game or IDM, you find that our ambulance is actually able to kind of capitalize on the fact that there are semi-cooperative agents on the road. We can also ask the question of how does traffic density actually impact our algorithm? So here we can simulate, re-simulate our traffic also with different personalities, but now go from low density traffic to high density traffic. And what we find is that at low density traffic, it really doesn't matter so much what the population is because cooperation is not necessarily as necessary. However, when we get to higher density traffic, where it's really helpful for the ambulance to have more pro-social agents on the road, we see the gap in the, that distance traveled uh, uh, broadening out where our algorithm is able to, again, capitalize on that more pro-social population. So to summarize the first contribution in my thesis, we're able to utilize social value orientation to model this heterogeneous cooperation. And then I propose a new algorithm that modifies iterative best response with this imagined shared control for generating these more semi-cooperative control policies. And then by deploying it in simulation, we can actually begin studying the effect of human personality on the algorithm's performance. So next, I'd like to move on to another kind of scenario you might find on a highway driving um, scenario, which is one of visibility aware planning. And the idea here is we wanna be able to consider the fact that human drivers on the road are going to have blind spots. And the reason we care about that is that these blind spots and areas of limited visibility can be actually very dangerous scenarios where even normal human drivers might actually collide into us just because they don't know we even exist. So the goal of this work is how can we actually generate autonomous trajectories that can proactively prevent these accidents by actually considering these blind spots? And this is actually not obvious how you do this. Um, first of all, you can't just completely avoid blind spots. So you don't wanna tell your autonomous vehicle, never go into blind spots because you'll, you won't be able to really drive on a highway. And second, it's not obvious how you can consider the fact that these human drivers are, are not just you know, losing sight of you and then forget about you, that they're actually maintaining some memory of the autonomous vehicle, even as it goes through the blind spot. And so we can look towards first, what, how would you normally do trajectory optimization with an autonomous vehicle? So one popular approach is called Frenet frame trajectory optimization, where you first start by parameterizing your trajectories based off of some center line that you'd like to track. And you parameterize it based off of the lateral and longitudinal deviations off of that center line. And then what you can do is sample candidate trajectories by varying the terminal conditions of those trajectories. So for example, the final speed or lateral deviation off of that center line. And then third, we compute some vehicle comfort costs based off of the square jerk or the amount of time taken to traverse um, that trajectory. 
And by doing so, we formulate some baseline costs that allows us to score these candidate trajectories and select our minimum cost trajectory to provide optimal comfort to the driver. And what's nice about this type of approach is that we can do things like consider the driver comfort. We can think about collision checking during sampling and checking for kinematic feasibility. However, there's no sense of visibility for these vehicles about the blind spots or thinking about visibility when coming up with these trajectories. So the approach that I've, uh, I've been working on and, and presented in this work is the idea of modeling the underlying ADO or human vehicles uh, uncertainty of the EGO vehicle, and then adding that as an explicit cost during trajectory optimization. And so how this works is we're going to model the blind spots of the vehicle and the estimation of the human driver using an extended common filter. And the idea here is that we're going to assume that the lead vehicle is taking some measurements yj of our autonomous vehicle and producing some estimate xi hat j of the autonomous vehicle's position. And while an ECAF might not be perfectly the model of how the lead vehicle is doing their estimation, it's a pretty good model for thinking about human brains because it's been shown that humans themselves have some Bayesian update that they're performing. And when we think about roads that also have autonomous vehicles, they themselves actually might be explicitly using an extended common filter. And so now that we have a model for how the human driver is actually taking, formulating its estimates of the autonomous vehicle, we can actually use the common update equations to, to compute the dynamics of the estimate covariance along the candidate trajectories. So here pictorially, we're just showing that estimate covariance along various points along the trajectory. And now we can introduce a new semi-cooperative visibility cost where now we take that baseline cost and add a new term, which is going to be penalizing specifically the estimate covariance of the ego vehicle. And we weight that cost by some visibility cost weight that allows us to design algorithms that vary how much should it consider the visibility cost of the other vehicle. And you can think of this in some ways as another form of an SVO, where we're thinking about semi-cooperation, where our ego vehicle is thinking about the visibility of the other vehicle. And in this work, I presented, I formulated two specific uh, costs. So first is a mean variance cost, where we're penalizing the average covariance of the estimate along a trajectory. And second, a terminal variance cost, where we're only penalizing at the end of the trajectory what the uncertainty is. And the idea there is that there are, there are some maneuvers where you really care about uh, the interactions towards the end of the trajectory. So now kind of putting this all together, what I propose is a visibility-aware trajectory optimization, where we start as before with this parameterization and sampling of your trajectories, but now we add a step where we're going to compute the estimate dynamics along a candidate trajectory. And then we add now when we do our, our trajectory costs, we're going to have this third term, which is going to be that estimate uh, uh, a penalty on the estimate covariance. And now when we look back at kind of the benefits, we now have the benefits of regular Fournette frame trajectory optimization. So we can consider things like the driver comfort, collision checking, and kinematic feasibility. But now we also can start considering the fact that the lead vehicle is going to have some visibility issues. So we looked at this in, in three different driving scenarios. So first on the left, we look at an overtaking maneuver where our ego vehicle enters the blind spot. And here you can see the estimate covariance dynamics as it grows when it enters the blind spot and contracts as it enters, uh, exits the blind spot. And at the bottom, what I'm showing here are the different trajectories based on the weightings of the visibility cost. So we can actually vary how much it considers that visibility. Uh, likewise, we also look at a braking scenario. So here the vehicle is braking while entering into a blind spot. And here it can try and minimize its visibility by either slowing down or trying to deviate from that trajectory. And on the bottom, I'm just showing different trajectories based on the weighting, that KM of the visibility cost. And you can see at lower levels of that visibility cost, the vehicle is just slowing down so that it can minimize the uncertainty as it enters the blind spot. And at higher weightings, it's actually deviating laterally off of the center line. And this is kind of a design choice. Yeah. You can decide how much should you be thinking about visibility as you're uh, generating your trajectories. And then finally, we also applied this to the example of approaching an intersection that's occluded by some scenery or some bushes. And you're thinking about cross traffic and making sure that you're visible to cross traffic. And likewise here, you can use the visibility aware trajectory generator to generate trajectories that are going to, going to maximize its visibility as it approaches uh, the intersection. So to summarize, um, the second algorithmic contribution is a visibility aware trajectory optimization framework 
that starts by generating these candidate feasible trajectories, computing that estimate covariance along each candidate trajectory, and then for each of those trajectory, computing a visibility cost, and then finally selecting a minimum cost trajectory to actually execute on the road. So, so far up until this point, what I've shown you is some of my work on trying to introduce semi-cooperation in the setting of highway driving. But next, I'd like to think a little bit more about complex intersections and how we can also think about semi-cooperation and understanding these mixed, these difficult mixed human and autonomous settings. So going back to kind of that, that day in Phoenix, you know, we have these complex intersections that we'd like to be able to control and manage. And one popular approach is to take your intersection and actually put an intelligent reserve intersection manager at your intersection. And there's a lot of research in this area and it's very promising because you can then provide reservations for the vehicles at your intersection and ensure that those reservations are safe, the trajectories are efficient and so forth. However, even though there's been a lot of research in this area, one of the limitations in these mixed human autonomous settings is that they typically assume that all the traffic participants are autonomous. And as we said, you know, we want to be able to deploy these cars in environments where there are still human drivers. And so when thinking about how we could perhaps manage a mixed autonomous and human intersection, some of the challenges that are arise are first, that we may have limited communication with the human drivers. So whereas the autonomous vehicles might be communi communicating with our intersection manager about where they're turning, human drivers may not communicate where they're actually turning at the intersection. And second, and maybe more fundamentally, we also want to think about generating optimizations that are actually socially compliant. So if we come back with uh, reservations for these vehicles through our intersection, we want to make sure that the drivers, the human drivers, actually accept our optimizations that we return to them. And so we can think now uh, back to kind of this idea of SVO and think about how do human drivers actually drive at intersections. So here on the left is an example of this white truck that's just going to egoistically cut in into the line to traffic, only really thinking about itself as it enters an intersection. And conversely, we have some agents who are going to approach the intersection and actually stop and actually take some hit of a wait time to let somebody else go before it, acting a little bit more pro-socially. So when we think about actually considering how we control an intersection, we can think about intersection management as actually some type of social dilemma where we have some agents in our, in our system that are going to be more pro-social and be willing to let other people go before them, whereas other agents in our system are going to be more egoistic or individualistic where they really only care about themselves and their wait time at the intersection. So now going back to kind of our problem formulation, we're going to now assume that we're going to have vehicles that are approaching our intersection, but now we also are, get to know, we assume that we know their SVO, uh, observing them outside of the intersection as they approach the intersection. And now the goal of our intersection manager is to return spatial and temporal reservations through our intersection, so a reser reservation window for each of the agents. And our ultimate goal is, um, oh, our high level goal of our intersection manager is to optimize this objective, which is to minimize the total wait time at our intersection. And I should just mention that our autonomous vehicles will assume are going to be communicating their directions that they're going, whereas our human agent does not necessarily communicate where it's going. So we'll start off actually with a common approach to intersection management, which is going to be to build an initial first come first serve queue. So how this works is that as vehicles approach our intersection, we'll build a queue of the vehicles as they approach. Um, and typically how, what would happen is uh, you would reserve the intersection based on first come first serve priority. And for the human non-communicating drivers, what we're going to do is we're going to reserve all the directions of our intersections, being a little bit conservative for the human drivers because we don't know necessarily where they're going. And the reason this is a, a, like a very kind of state-of-the-art approach is that first of all, it's tractable. So the runtime of this vehicle, of this algorithm is in the worst case linear with the number of vehicles in our system. So we don't have to think about the exponential combinations of vehicles in our system. On the flip side, one of the downsides of, a, of an algorithm like this is it's fairly conservative. So it strictly follows the priority of the vehicles as they arrive at the intersection. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to start off with this first come first serve queue and take that queue. But now what we're going to do is consider and simulate two different scenarios. So the first is going to be this first come first serve ordering. So the ordering as the vehicles approach the intersection, 
And we're going to simulate their wait times at the intersection with the first ordering. But we're also now going to consider a pairwise swap of the vehicles in our intersection. And, and also there predict the estimated wait times of the vehicles given the swapped ordering of the vehicles. And in addition, because we know their SVOs, we can also compute a social utility function for both of them. So we can compute the utility of the, both agents in the first come first serve ordering. And also now the new utility function, utility values for both agents in the swapped ordering. And now what we'll do is we're going to execute a swap between the agents if both of the agents improve in the swapped ordering. So if both of their utility functions in the simulated swap, we're going to actually allow both of them to switch positions in the queue. And the idea here is that we're doing this because we can optimize the intersection now, but respecting that both of the agents are happy to actually do that swap. Once we find whether it is uh, improving if we swap, we then actually go to each position in our queue and continue this process of swapping the positions of the queue or not swapping them if, if it's not benefiting both agents socially. And now once we have our final ordering of the queue, we can go send it back through our reservation manager, managing the tiles in their intersection and for the autonomous vehicles communicating directly with them or communicating with our human driver using our traffic light. And what's nice about this algorithm is it's still tractable. So we're still only visiting each position in the queue once. So it's still linear with the number of vehicles on, in, their, in our system. But now we are also socially compliant. So we're respecting each individual social preferences as we're building our queue. So just to summarize, this, uh, my algorithm that I proposed in my PhD is first come, first serve with pairwise SVO swaps, where we initially build this first come, first serve queue. We simulate the first come, first serve and swap ordering. And then we compute the social utility function and allow swaps if it's improving for both of the agents. So here too, we can now simulate our algorithm in um, uh, intersection uh, scenario. So we have different uh, coloring of the vehicles again by their personalities. And here you can see a swap is being executed um, using our algorithm. And like before, we can ask questions like, how does the uh, composition of our system between human and autonomous agents, so between those communicating and not communicating agents, impact our algorithm? And likewise, how does the composition of the SVO of the agents, so for example, we can put populations that are all individualistic or egoistic in our system, or we could, for example, put a mixture of personalities in our system and ask, how does our intersection manager actually perform? So in this plot, what I'm, I'm showing on the y-axis is the average vehicle wait time in our system, where we'd like to be lower, so lower wait times for our vehicles. And on the x-axis, I'm plotting different percentage of human drivers in our system. And what you can find is compared to first come, first serve, which is the green line, all of our, our populations do better than first strictly first come, first serve. And we find that the best performance, the lowest wait time happens when our population is fully pro-social. In addition, you can see this trend that the more human drivers we have in the system, the longer or higher wait times we'll have. And this is because we have to reserve the entire intersection for the human drivers. So there's an additional cost to having human drivers in our system. So this was looking at the overall average vehicle wait time at our intersection. But we'd also like to ask the question of how does the individual's performance change when they use this algorithm over, for example, first come, first serve. So in the following uh, plot, what we're doing is we're looking at asking the question of how does the wait time decrease for human drivers in our system versus autonomous drivers? And what we find is an interesting result that um, even though both vehicles actually improve in our system, the autonomous agents actually get a higher decrease in their average wait time. And the intuition here is that because the human drivers have this extra cost to our system where we're reserving the entire intersection, they typically find themselves kind of moving back in the queue. And so while this might not be exactly desirable, it's an interesting observation of how, what happens when we deploy these with different populations of agents. Uh, similarly, we can ask a similar question with different personalities. So we can look at a population where we have a mixture of individualistic and pro-social agents and ask how does their wait time change uh, when we use our algorithm compared to first come, first serve? And here too, we find that the egoistic agents, so the ones that are mostly self-interested, they actually get an improved uh, decrease in change in wait time. And the idea here too, is that they're kind of benefiting from the fact that there are pro-social agents in the system. However, they kind of don't have to contribute as much because they're egoistic. So again, an interesting result of how the improvements of our system are not necessarily equally felt by all the traffic participants. 
So to summarize what I've shown in this contribution is how we can actually utilize this concept of social value orientation and incorporate this into how we actively manage intersections with mixed human and autonomous vehicles. And I propose an algorithm called first come first serve with pairwise SVO swapping that's both tractable and yet still accounts for the fact that humans are willing to help and the mixed communication you find in these mixed environments. So um, that was um, my, my work on socially compliant intersections. And before I move on to my last algorithmic contribution, I'd like to first describe a system that I've developed that both I've used in evaluating, for example, the previous um, algorithm I just talked about, and also will be using it for the last part, the last algorithm in my thesis. And the high level idea of the system I've developed is that we really like to ultimately deploy these algorithms and test them out in the physical world. But there are many challenges, for example, if we want to do full scale deployment when we're thinking about these interactive um, large scale algorithms. So the first challenge is cost. So if we want to take our algorithms and put them on, let's say, a system of multiple vehicles entering a traffic intersection, it's very challenging from a cost perspective. It doesn't quite scale if every single time you need to buy a new autonomous vehicle. And you need to buy you know, eight autonomous vehicles just to test this out. But even if you had the money, there's a second issue, which is safety. You know, We're trying to develop these very interactive algorithms, whether that's dangerous scenarios like going into people's blind spots or high-speed highway maneuvers. It's very difficult to imagine how anyone would feel comfortable necessarily during the testing of these algorithms to just go put it on a full-scale car and put it on the road. And then finally, as I've shown, one of the things that I'm interested in doing and we'd like to be able to do when we develop these algorithms is to be able to experiment and better understand these algorithms in a more controlled research environment. So as I mentioned, kind of existing um, ways to evaluate autonomy in general is either full-scale uh, full scale vehicles where you're, it's expensive to actually scale them and they're quite dangerous. Another approach would be to use utilize simulation. Um, and the limitation here is that you still have the sim to real gap where you're simulating the physical world. And many times these simulators are kind of failed, are, are, you know, they, they're kind of designed to work well, and we'd like to be able to see how do our algorithms actually work in the real physical world. And then finally, a popular approach that's utilized in many kind of autonomy um, research and tasks is to use data sets where you deploy your car and you collect data, and then you evaluate your algorithm on that data. And what's it's good for very task-specific evaluation. However, you can't do any closed loop testing. So you can't evaluate, how does my algorithm actually, my how do how does, my planner actually get evaluated and how do the agents actually react to my planner? And so what I've uh, been working on and built is the mini city, which is really a scaled down research environment where we can actually deploy physical cars or scaled physical cars in the real world while deploying our interactive algorithms. So to give you a little introduction to the mini city, um, it's made out of, of scaled uh, physical city environment. So we have the rubber roads, we have grass, we have scaled houses to give realistic scenery. We have our traffic lights that we can uh, deploy. And then we also have motion capture, which provides both ground truth evaluation so we can actually evaluate our algorithms. And also we can simulate the GPS that you would find in the real world. And very importantly, we wanted to have vehicles that actually are very are similar to what you find in a full scale car. So we made sure to actually integrate it with the kind of sensors you'd find on an autonomous, autonomous vehicle. So for example, we put LiDAR on our cars, we have G onboard GPU, speed controllers, IMU, and stereo cameras that we have on our vehicles. In addition, importantly, we also deploy a full autonomy stack. So we have things like collision avoidance, object detection, we do high level routing and trajectory planning, intersection navigation. So we can actually deploy a full vehicle in the presence of other agents. And now we can go back to an algorithm like the one I just described, our socially compliant intersection manager, and we can go and actually deploy them on our traffic lights in the mini city and actually explore how do these algorithms work when we now have real vehicles that are kind of interacting with our system. And what you can see here under the hood is the reservations that are being generated for our vehicles while they're driving live in the mini city. And we can repeat actually many of the kind of um, evaluations we also did in simulation. So for example, on the right is just a a plot where we're plotting also here the throughput through our intersection and how it varies based on the personalities of our vehicles or whether they're communicating or not. But we felt that that wasn't quite enough. You know, we're thinking about these human interactive algorithms and we really would like to bring humans also into the mini city. So what we can do is actually place a first person view camera in the driver's seat of our autonomous vehicles and then provide a user with goggles where they can actually see from the perspective of the car and also control 
the driving of the vehicle. And then we can actually bring humans into the mini city and drive the car as if they're sitting there interacting with our intelligent traffic lights, interacting with other autonomous vehicles. So just to demonstrate, for example, how you could actually use this, we utilize this kind of uh, this um, platform to consider a, a slight modification on our intersection manager, where now we're not just providing reservations to our cars, but we're actually going to actively take over control of our vehicles when they're inside the intersection. But one of the challenges, if we really want users to be okay with this, there are a lot of different settings and parameters of our algorithm that could be varied and we'd like to understand how it should be. So for example, you could vary, it's not clear whether you should take over control of the car right when it enters the intersection, or for example, further out um, as it approaches the intersection or even closer. And likewise, how should the autonomy actually take over? So for example, should the autonomy take over by a human activated switch that they press, or should it happen just automatically once they approach the intersection? But now that we have a physical platform, we can actually bring a user into the mini city and have them drive one of these cars utilizing this algorithm. So you can see outside of the intersection, he's driving the car. And then as he gets into the, into the intersection, his hands come up and autonomy takes over. And now we can actually probe our user and ask them, how did you actually prefer the algorithm? Did you like it when we had the takeover happen farther away from the intersection, right when you enter the intersection, or do you want it automatic or user initiated? But you know, we, once we built this platform, we thought, what else? How else can we actually utilize the mini city as an evaluation platform? And we can actually think more generally speaking about how we can use our scaled mini city to evaluate your autonomy. So, for example, imagine you're trying to consider two different state-of-the-art object detectors. So, for example, let's say you're trying to choose between stereo RCNN, which is a camera-based algorithm, or Pixar, which is a lidar-based algorithm. Now we can actually go and deploy them on our vehicles in the mini city. And what we can do is not only upstream object detection evaluation, so doing what you would typically do in a data set, which is just understand how well am I doing at object detection, but you can also look downstream at kind of what you really are hoping to understand is how does this impact, for example, collision avoidance or collision detection? Does my ability to do object detection impact, which of my algorithms actually impact collision detection? And this is not just for object detection, we can look at another task like state estimation where we can both evaluate upstream what hardware configurations provide me with my best position or estimate of where I am on the map, but also actually look downstream and ask, how does this impact my ability to stay within my lane, which again is the metric we really care about. And to just try and kind of like motivate this a little bit more, thinking about what's wrong with just doing upstream performance, let's take a bit of a toy example where we have two detectors, detector one and detector two, and they're both not perfect at detecting objects. In fact, if you evaluate both of them though upstream, you can see that both of the vehicles, both of the, these detectors are able to detect 75% of the objects. So at face value, they seem to perform well if you just look upstream, but now we're gonna ask downstream, how does collision avoidance work? Well, you can see on the left, the detector is going to identify a car right in front of it and say, well, let's stop the vehicle. Whereas on the right, even though it has the same upstream performance, it's going to say drive ahead and crash into the car. But you can actually capture this if you can actually evaluate downstream how your planner reacts to the upstream task. And so now with the mini city, we can actually go and deploy these algorithms and both evaluate upstream performance and downstream performance. So we can deploy Pixar in the mini city, Stereo RCNN, and even compare it to ground truth bounding boxes. And now we evaluate our object detector in the presence of other vehicles and, and we can measure both upstream evaluation. So how well is it actually identifying objects in an image but also downstream evaluation. So how many handovers did it have to do with the safety driver or what's the false negative or positive rate when it comes to collision avoidance? So just to summarize, um, during my PhD, I've developed a 110 scaled miniature city that allows us to actually deploy our interactive algorithms and evaluate not only our semi-cooperative algorithms um, such as our in in intelligent intersection manager with human drivers, but also actually use it more generally speaking as a research platform for evaluating and comparing autonomy. So now with that kind of in mind in this new tool in our toolbox, I'd like to move on to our final um, algorithmic contribution, which is infrastructure-based failure detection. And the motivation here is we'd like to be able to prevent failures that are uh, collisions due to failures before vehicles approach the intersection. So the high level idea is we'd like to be able to observe because we have intelligent traffic managers, we can observe the vehicles outside of the intersection. And we'd like to be able to predict whether there's some type of failure or reckless driver, and then warn oncoming traffic that they're approaching. And so one way you could think about doing this is a more data-based approach 
where you just collect data of failure-induced drivers or reckless drivers and compare that with data you've collected of nominal drivers and then train a neural network to predict whether there's a failure or nominal driver. And while this is kind of a nice idea, you can imagine a lot of uh, issues with this, which is one, how do you actually safely collect this data? And then even if you were able to somehow cl safely collect this data, how would you feel safe actually testing this algorithm? And I, I know for myself, I wouldn't necessarily want to be on the road while someone's actually either collecting or testing this algorithm. However, now that we have the mini city, we can actually deploy failure modes in a safe way. So we can take our autonomous vehicles and actually deploy, for example, here we have periodic steering noise and speed noise that we ask, add to our vehicles. We can have a speeding driver that is speeding above the speed limit of the city. We can also mess with the perception of the vehicle. So here we have a vehicle that is not correctly anymore doing lane detection. And then finally, we can even bring users and ask them to drive recklessly through the mini city. And now we can actually think of this perspective and actually collect data and train off of trajectories we collected and train a neural network that we call failure net, where we feed in subsequences of our trajectories into an RNN. And then we decode the last hidden layer of our RNN into our estimate of whether we have a nominal or failure driver. And specifically, we looked at three different types of RNN, LSTM, GRU, and CFC, which is a, a more a newer kind of continuous time version of an RNN. And now we can go in the mini city and actually collect that data. So we deploy both failure drivers and nominal drivers, and we collect upwards of three hours of training data of these vehicles in our mini city. And then once we've trained our network, we can actually go and deploy it in the mini city. So in the following video, what I'm showing you is the, the estimator online. So the sphere, the red sphere means there's a failure detected and our intelligent traffic light is stopping the cross traffic. And then in a moment, you'll find here we have a nominal driver is being detected and cross traffic is allowed to now proceed normally through our intersection. And now we can actually also evaluate the accuracy of our detector. So we can do it both offline with our validation data set and also deployed in our mini city and we compare to various types of baselines and neural networks. And what we find is that we get upwards of 84% accuracy um, across our different failure modes. And what's nice is that because we're doing this uh, in a kind of end-to-end -end fashion, we're generalizing across the different failure modes and not overfitting, for example, to one type of failure mode. So to summarize, in this final algorithm, what I've shown to you is an end-to-end -end algorithm for detecting vehicle failures and warning oncoming traffic, and then a pipeline for actually generating and deploying those failure-induced uh, driving styles and then training and evaluating the failure net in a one-tenth scale mini city. So um, in summary, this is kind of uh, what I've been working on in my PhD. And I just want to highlight that one way we can think of each of these projects in some ways is we're doing semi-cooperation on different dimensions of driving. So in the first project, we were looking at the state and control of the human driver. Then we were looking at the estimation or perception of the, the human driver, then high level at, at things like wait time, and then finally a latent failure variable of the human drivers or the other vehicles in our system. And you can think more generally speaking and thinking about kind of future directions, what are other dimensions of cooperation we can think about for autonomous vehicles? In addition, what are some new uh, psycholo psychology models we could be incorporating into our autonomous planners? Things like how do we incorporate uncertainty um, into how we actually do the planning? Um, thinking about how we can influence human behavior. So for example, how can we influence those bad actors or those egoistic agents in our system? And finally, today I've been focusing primarily at self-driving cars but thinking about other robotic and autonomy applications where this idea of semi-cooperation could really benefit the performance of these algorithms. And along the way, I've really highlighted today the algorithms that I've developed in my PhD. And along the way, I've also presented a system, the mini city and different applications of how we can actually use it from a research perspective. And then finally, it, how we utilize these algorithms and systems to better understand how they perform in various uh, settings. And so with that, I, I finished my technical portion of uh, my PhD thesis, and now I, I move to the fun part, which is which is the acknowledgments. So um, uh, let's see, that was a tour de force. Um, let's take a few minutes to see if there are questions from the audience, and uh, we will reserve a block of time for Norm's discussion with the committee. Are there any questions from the audience? Yeah, and also Danielle, I would recommend that if people have questions in person that they go to the podium where the microphone is. Um, yeah, or I can repeat, John, yeah. go ahead. Say, say your question, I'll repeat. So the, your example with the intersection, it looks really great on there, but then if you go to an intersection in Boston at rush hour, and you 
people are blocking the intersection and really crazy maneuvers. So I wonder if you have any insight, uh, sort of, on how your algorithms and the pro social versus. Uh, so uh, let me let me rephrase John's question. John is wondering whether um, your intersection manager can handle Boston drivers and Boston intersections, or uh, does it only handle Seattle drivers and intersections where everything is much more polite than in Boston? Yeah. So I think so. The answer is yes. I mean, the idea here is first is kind of twofold. One is that because we're utilizing the SVO, we can account for that when we're thinking about the reservations through the intersection. So, you know, as we kind of joke in lab, Boston drivers might be a little bit more egoistic and uh, maybe in other country, other cities, they're a little bit nicer. So I think the idea of having this flexibility for people to adapt based on personality and cooperation, I think is part of the benefits of this type of algorithm. And then the second thing is that um, I have been looking primarily at managed intersections. So the idea is that we are providing intersections and predicting how they're going through the intersection. And I think as we think about providing reservations, I think we can account also for you know, how compliant they are even with the reservations we give them. And there's other dimensions we should be thinking about. So it right, sounds like go. a good challenge. Yes. Uh, any other question from the audience? Quick question from the audience. Go ahead. Can you take into account uh, bicycles that might be riding on the road, electric bicycles and regular bicycles? Yeah, so I mean, it's, in our system doesn't really change depending on that. I think um, the only difference is, I mean, if these are electrical bicycles that are even aware that the traffic light is there, I think it's a little bit of a different story. Uh, but if these are bicycles that are part of traffic, then I think we could easily integrate it. I think if we have uh, bikes that like to go on the sidewalk and kind of ignore the lights, um, I think we'd have to think a little bit differently about how we consider their reservations because we don't, we might be a little bit um, more careful about how they actually behave in the intersection. One question from the audience at Stata. Um, this first part, how did you actually solve this numerical optimization problems and how did it stay with real time? Did you hear the question? How um, did you solve the, num uh, the numerical optimization problems and how did they scale? So it uh, depends which one. So the Intersection manager is designed oh, to be very- So then the first one in the oh, second- okay, yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. the first one, it's still a challenge. So um, it's, it's de depending on which portion of the shared control is happening, it's either um, gonna vary linearly or perhaps um, kind of exponentially, I guess, depending on the number of vehicles. So we try and, so it's not quite as fast as we would like it to be. And as far as scaling, one of the ways you can kind of limit that is both by the neighborhood of vehicles you're considering. Um, and then, um, but yeah, it's, I think it's still a challenge a bit about how large of a system. And I think also when we think about other methods, one of the reasons we do iterative best response is that there's some aspect of also tractability. You're kind of fixing the other control inputs of the other vehicles. So it's a little bit more scalable and we're kind of moving more cooperatively in that sense. So you get some hit as you scale up the vehicles, but it's perhaps not as, bad as other algorithms, but it's still um, still kind of work to be done on being able to really scale it up and, and think about deploying it on like a real vehicle. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let's thank Norm once again. And I'd like to invite uh, everyone.